In my last video, I talked about the history of Christmas, Christmas trees and ornaments going way back to the medieval times and before, and in particular in the Victorian times. So I'd like to kind of continue the story of the history of some of our traditions that we have or some of the objects that we use, and not really particularly being a Christmas item, but often used at Christmas, are snow globes. And sometimes the history behind something is even more interesting than the object itself. And I find that to be the case with snowballs. Most things, the history is contradictory, and there are different stories as to how things came about. But in this particular video about the snow globes, I'm going to concentrate on one story about the invention of the snow globe, which took place in Vienna in the year 1900. In the year 1900, a surgeon came to a man named Edwin Percy with a problem. Percy was a fine instruments mechanic. And the problem the surgeon had was that he said that the electric light bulbs in his surgery were not vibrant enough to cast sufficient light during operations. And he wondered if Percy could improve on the dim bulbs to make them brighter. In searching to an answer to this problem, Percy took an idea from the shoemakers and needleworkers and doll makers of the time who had stumbled upon a clever little trick with a globe filled with water or a jar filled with water and a candle. Doll makers, lace makers, shoemakers discovered that if you put the candle in exactly the right spot behind the globe, it produced a illuminating effect, also a magnifying effect, under which to do your very delicate work. Farm wives in Victorian times realized this as well, and if they had to darn socks deep into the night, which is about the only extra time they had sometimes, this was a great boon to them. So Percy began experimenting with this using the light bulb behind the glass. So the light bulb behind the glass globe filled with water did not really seem to be much of an improvement on the normal light bulb. And he thought maybe he needed to put something in the water to allow the light to bounce off of it. So he sprinkled the white flakes of a baby food called Seminola into the water, and the white flakes slowly fell to the bottom of the globe, just like snow. This bit of serendipity inspired the man to carve a little scene, place it inside the globe, and create one of the first snow globes. Now, whether or not he ever did improve the uh, light bulb for the surgeon, I do not know. I don't think so. I think he went on to create snow globes because in 1900, he and his brother patented the snow globe and opened a shop in Vienna, which is open to this day. That's where much of this information comes from. Now, there is competing evidence that the actual snow globe was invented prior to that. Twenty years, as a matter of fact, they were shown at the Paris Exposition. But since we're concentrating on the man that patented the snow globe, we will stick with that story. Now, in 1927, in order to make these more affordable to people, because Percy's snowballs were very expensive. They were, he was an artisan and they were, they were all hand done and hand carved and they were out of reach for the average person. But in America, in 1927, an entrepreneur found a way to number one, improve the snow globe, make it at a less, lot less expensive, a much less expensive cost and by adding something called glycol to the water, the snow would fall more slowly to the ground, making the snowball a little more exceptional. Actually, that were used for snow at the time 
were bits of marble and tiny bits of bone. And until plastic was invented, they began to use shredded plastic. And I believe that would have been closer to the 1930s. By the time the 1930s rolled around, you could purchase an American-made snowball, snow globe, for less than a dollar. But a dollar was still quite a bit of money at that time. Snow globes never really caught on hugely until in the 1940s, a movie called Citizen Kane. In the very first scene of a movie, you can see a little snow globe with a log cabin that the actor Orson Welles is holding in his hand. He drops it, and it tumbles to the ground and crashes. It was after that that these became so popular. That's all it took. And to this very day, snow globes are become a very common and wonderful little object. Now, this one is so, so, so old. They say you can repair these and change the water out. I'd love to learn how to do that. This is a little bear inside. This is a porcelain vase, and so I think this is probably from the 1930s. The other two, I have no idea. I chose them for the subject matter because I love the penguins. I love the cardinal. I really um, just like the old ones, even though you can barely see that. The water's really muddy. Let's see what we can do about fixing that one day. So snow globes. A winter, a Christmas tradition. So continuing from last week's video on the Victorian Christmas and traditions that have lasted throughout the years, I'm going to talk about postcards today, sending Christmas postcards. Sending Christmas postcards was actually an offshoot of the trend for exchanging greeting cards, which started in the mid-1800s. It was really popular in America, and the cards were printed in the USA, but also imported from Germany. Popular subject matter tended to be things like angels, and nativities, and Christmas trees, and Father Christmas. But I have a collection here which has absolutely none of those, but it's so odd that all of them have birds. I've got all these beautiful old Christmas cards, and almost every single one of them has little <laughs> red and gray birds. They look like little English robins, so as not to let anything beautiful go to waste. Postcard albums were created, and just like the old photograph albums like my mother used to have when we were children. These were made specifically for the size of a postcard. And here you hear again all these little birds. I don't know how I ended up with all these little birds. Ah, here we have a few that are not little birds, so let's see. We've got a darling little English cottage here, but it says a Merry Christmas on it. I don't see any snow, but here's a lovely church. And a woodland scene here. This one has, my goodness, greenery. Looks like Ireland, um, 1910 with poinsettias. And this one has a little red house with snow and a lantern. So I guess they weren't all little birds in my collection. All right, here's one with the postage of 1912, coming from Michigan. Dear Uncle and Aunt, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Hmm, not very creative, but it was a one cent stamp. One cent stamp back then. Here is a, another group of little birds. I can see why they collected them. I mean, look at them. They're still with me to this day, after somebody had collected them for many years. Here's a one cent stamp, Dear Aunt. This, doesn't this seem like Christmas with all the beautiful blanket of snow on the ground? I'm head over heels with Christmas and presume you are too. Write me a long letter and I'll try to answer it. Lovingly yours, Janet. <laughs> Oh, 
Ah, a lovely wintry scene here. 1909, one cent stamp from Ottawa, Canada. Hmm, this one never got sent. Now this one is a New Year's card, but I really like this one. And this one is also a one cent stamp and it's 1908. Dear Jua, I'm trying to remember all my girls at least once. How are you? Wishing you a happy new year. Take good care of my nephew with love. Write me your teacher. Mrs. Pratt's. <laughs> Traditionally sent for many, many years. Last year I did a video called Under the Tree in 1903. You might want to go back and look at it if you're interested in the toys um, from the early 1900s that a child might have found under the Christmas tree. But one of the things I didn't talk about were books, because books were such a popular gift. And many of these books, in fact, some of them are extremely old. And I really wanted to find something really old that I could read that had to do with maybe a Christmas story. This is 1833. But I did find something special. And I thought I would just do a little reading here. But here I found a book that was specifically a Christmas gift, and I wanted to read something out of it because I just love the vocabulary from that time period. I think it was really beautiful and such humor. This was to Mildred A. Cardi from Mama, Christmas, December 25th, 1900. And I chose a few little writings in here that I thought would be fun. They're not specifically Christmas stories at all. I looked for a Christmas story, but they were just too long to read. But since this was a Christmas gift, I thought I would read to you something rather humorous, I think. We're going to read Richard the Cat. A Richard the Cat. The actions of Farmer Pendry's cat, Richard, had become a disgrace to all the animals of the place. Instead of catching mice and rats as he should, he was stealing milk and meat out of Farmer Pendry's kitchen and robbing birds' nest eggs and stealing eggs. He was also given over to the very bad habit of prowling around nights and raising all sorts of trouble. In spite of repeated warnings, he persisted his evil course until it was seen that no halfway measures would do. Accordingly, he was arrested and his case was taken before the jury for trial. Although most eloquently defended by the renowned Blackie, who lived at Mr. Webster's, yet when the Honorable Judge Pedro summed up his case, there was nothing for the jury to do except condemn him to a day's confinement in the stocks. This was a very serious punishment for a cat of such really fine feelings as Richard. Repentance came too late in his case. In spite of his earnest protestations, he was fastened in the cruel stocks and left to his fate. And it was a cruel fate. The rat and mouse that really ought to have been grateful to him for not hunting them now came to mock him. The mouse was even mean enough to take advantage of his helpless condition to tickle his feet. Two young pigs, hardly knowing whether to look solemn or to appear to enjoy the situation, grunted around all day. A saucy jay perched right under Richard's nose and twitted him about his condition. A gosling, a puppy dog, and a young frog formed a part of this audience. Whoops. And even some cranes flying high in the air came down to investigate. Probably the most cruel cut of all was occasioned by the conduct of his boon companion, Frank, who lived with old Mrs. Podger. Instead of taking warning as he should, the graceless fellow actually hung over the back fence and laughed. Poor Richard! Let us hope that he forsook his evil ways and became, in all respects, a model cat. <laughs> Richard the Cat. Today we're going to be preparing a Christmas tea, but before we start on the recipes, I wanted to talk about pomanders. 
or pomanders, as some would pronounce it, depending on where you live in the world. I'm not sure how the pomanders came to be associated with Christmas, because they've actually been around for a very, very long time. In the Middle Ages, they were small filigree balls of gold, silver, or ivory filled with fragrant spices, and the purpose of uh, these would be to keep away unpleasant odors, so they would be worn around your neck or even around your waist. But today's version of pomanders would be a clove-studded piece of fruit, whether it's a piece of citrus fruit or an apple. The cloves pressed into the fruit actually preserve the fruit for a very, very long time. And my first experience with these was actually about third or fourth grade. Our teacher said we were going to do a Christmas project, and she told us that the only thing we had to do was bring a little container of cloves. I remember my mother not being very happy about that because cloves were very expensive, and we had no idea what the cloves were for. But the teacher brought the bag of oranges, and we proceeded to poke our little oranges full of cloves. We had really sore fingers afterwards, but we had these wonderful balls of fragrant spice. Maybe it's because we always associate such spicy scents such as clove and cinnamon with Christmas, probably due to all the baking, is the reason that we also associate Almonders with Christmas. But I love to make these and hang them on the tree. Generally just put them in bowls. And the easiest way to do a pomander without absolutely annihilating your fingers is to poke it. Little rows of poke little holes along with some sort of sharp tool. And then take your cloves and just poke them in. Now as the fruit dries, the holes will become a little looser. So you don't want to poke those holes too deep. You don't want your cloves to fall out. That's never happened in my case. The lovely thing about these is they can be hung in closets and put in drawers. They do keep away moths. I like to keep them with my wool when I'm storing my wool for making needle felting. And these actually make lovely little gifts. But the reason I want to do these before we do the Christmas tea is because I think they also make lovely little favors to put at each plate, each place mat, place setting I should say, wrapped in a ribbon and presented to your guest because they smell so, so wonderful. Basically, they just fill the air with scent. So what you want to do is cover your orange or your piece of fruit as much as you can. You can also do just little designs in these without having to cover the entire piece of fruit, but I think they work better if you actually do cover. Cover it with cloves. Cloves are expensive, so if you plan on doing this as a family, or doing it for gifts. Buy them in bulk just to save money because spices to this day are still quite pricey. After your pomander is completely filled, you want to roll it in cinnamon and cloves ground and orris root. Orris root, I'm sorry. Now these should last for years. The scent should last for years, but if they start to lose their fragrance and they need to be refreshed, you can actually do that by soaking them for a little while in water and then refreshing them once again in this mixture of cloves and cinnamon and then letting it, or even clove oil will work too and then letting them dry out for a couple days and then they're just as good as they were when you first made them. Mmm, this smells so wonderful. So just cover your pomander with lots and lots of spice. 
fill in every crack and just squeeze it in there. Smells so, so good. Mm. And then wrap it in a ribbon. And we will use these on our Christmas tea table just to add to the ambiance. melting my chocolate over the boiling water so as not to get this chocolate so hot that it boils just enough to melt it so that I can use it on the back of those Florentines nice, nice and creamy okay I'm keeping my chocolate nice and soft over this hot, hot water. And then I'm going to take each little Florentine and put a nice round blob in the middle. And then I'm going to place it right upon this paper, flatten it out. and let it get hard. Do that with each Florentine. This tea we're making blueberry scones. Now we did make scones before, several months back, and we also made clotted cream, so if you want those recipes I'll link those below. But this time we're going to make them in a little disc and we're going to cut them into little wedges. So we're going to start out with two cups of flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, one quarter teaspoon of salt, one half cup of cold butter. Freeze your butter first and then it's much easier to grate. Now mix your dough into a nice coarse meal with your fingers or a pastry blender. The 
feel a little gritty and you'll still have little chunks of butter in it but that's okay that's what you want add a beautiful little speckled egg of course it doesn't have to be a speckled egg <laughs> this is what my girls gave me today I'm so proud of them it is really cold it's getting to winter and my girls are still laying eggs every day I'm so proud of those little hens then we're going to mix it together and we are also going to put in one teaspoon of vanilla and I'm just going to work that into a dough ball What we're trying to do actually is bring the dough together right now. You know, it's funny that I'm doing cooking videos. It's just really funny because <laughs> for a long time I didn't like to cook at all. I mentioned that in my first cooking video last year. And I mentioned that my father was actually a professional chef. And I remember way back in the day when television was only in black and white and there weren't any cooking shows on TV. My father made an apple pie on television. <laughs> you know, he kept cracking jokes and he had everybody in the studio just laughing. And I never forget seeing my dad making a pie, an apple pie, on black and white television. <laughs> I think it was a news program or something. But I'm going to start working that with my hands now. All I want to do is blend the dough together. Now this is just a standard dough for any kind of scone or scone, whichever way you wish to pronounce it. And from here on in you can add whatever you want. So if you want cinnamon and brown sugar scones or lemon scones or raspberry scones, whatever you want. But today we are going to make blueberry scones. I'm going to add, I'm going to work in a cup of fresh blueberries to my scone mixture. Last time we made scones, we used um, this little biscuit cutter and made beautiful rounded scones. But this time I just want to make the little wedges of scones. So. I patted this into a nice little round shape, cutting this into about eight wedges. And if you want a more dense scone, don't add the egg. Now place your lovely scone wedges on an ungreased cookie sheet. And then Brush the tops with cream, put them in a 425 degree oven for about 12 minutes. Well, welcome to our Christmas tea here in Hopalong Hollow 2020. Nothing too extravagant on the table. Everything was easy to make. I just gave you the recipe for the blueberry scones and the Florentines, but we also have raspberry tarts on the table, chocolate maraschino cookies, and for our main course for our tea is quiche Lorraine. Today's guests are Horatio Hare, and Bitty Brown. The reasons I made the Florentines was just because of the jewel-like fruits inside have such beautiful little Christmas colors and of course the raspberries bring a lot of color to the table 
and of course the fruits and the apples and the holly and the greenery, they all add that festive touch to it. The blueberry scones turned out beautifully, perfectly. You must, must try them. And the clotted cream is divine. Spencer here would have been beautiful with mulled cider in it, but instead I just put in water so that there could be two choices for tea with tea bags on the one hand of Royal Blend by Fortnum and Mason and the other tea steeping in the pot is an Afternoon Blend by Fortnum and Mason. So I mixed up all the blue china today because I think they just look great together. Just what ties them together are the colors. And I chose the Courier and Ives again because it does have a wonderful winter scene on it. So we've got the Courier and Ives mixed with Coaching Scenes by Johnson Brothers and various other makers. Adams. But don't the blues all look great together? I also love the blues with copper. I think blue and copper just look so gorgeous together. I'd love to get a set of copper flatware someday. But in the meantime, I'm just having to use the silver and this Bakelite, this odd Bakelite <laughs> set of flatware, which I really like. Now, the reason I think Florentines make a pretty um, Christmas cookie is just because of the colors. They're like little jewels inside that. And normally you would make these by dropping them on a cookie sheet. I also made some like that. But I liked to do the muffin tin because they're thicker. And if you like fruitcake, like I do, you will like Florentines. If you don't like fruitcake, forget it, because this is just full of nuts and fruit. And because I couldn't find any citron, or I should say my husband, I sent him to the store for the citron, and they didn't have any. He brought home instead dried fruits, which worked out beautifully. So this is actually um, kiwi, apricots, and what was the other dried fruit? Dried pineapple. So that made a beautiful um, combination and also a beautiful little Florentine. Another Christmas tradition that's more of a modern Christmas tradition is watching a Christmas movie year after year after year because you love it so much. And I wonder if any of you have favorite Christmas movies that you are consistently watching for the last 10 years or so. And I do have a few favorites myself, and you're going to think that I'm really, really silly when I tell you that I love A Christmas Carol, but my favorite Christmas Carol movie was the one with Albert Finney called Scrooge, and it's actually a musical. But the songs are so good along the lines of uh, the musical Oliver, and I just love that movie. It really captures the Dickens spirit. And um, what's another one? Oh, oh, you could just see how sentimental I am. I love The Waltons Christmas and also The Little House on the Prairie Christmas. But the other night, this movie kept showing up on my YouTube feed, and it was called The Christmas Candle, so I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. Very skeptical of it. And I'm telling you, the movie was so good, it made me cry at the end. And if I cry at the end of a movie, I know it was a really good movie. Now, it might be a little too corny for some people, but I really loved it. So if you get a chance, go on YouTube and watch the Christmas Candle, and I believe it came out in 2013. So, so this being the last video of the year, although I wanted to make more than this, I just ran out of time. I wanted to do a Pioneer Christmas tree, but I guess that'll have to wait till next year. And I had a lot more Christmas traditions I wanted to cover. But these videos, they're time consuming and sometimes you just run out of time. But I want to thank all of you who have been so kind left comments, and just been such faithful um, viewers of my video content. I really do appreciate it. I read every single comment. Don't answer every single comment, because I, I really can't sometimes, but I do thank you so much. So from here in Hopalong Hollow in this old house, from Horatio and myself and Biddy Brown.
and James. We wish you a wonderful Christmas and may God be with you until we see you next time.